Hi, hopefully those of you in the viewing audience will know that I am State Senator Eric Coleman and I enjoy the privilege of serving as the State Senator from the 2nd Senatorial District here in Connecticut. I want to welcome you to this version of a new program which is to be called the Senate Reports. And uh, on this program what I'd like to do uh, as your host is to discuss uh, legislative issues, issues of interest of concern and interest to the community as well as from time to time interview special guests uh, who will be part of the program. Today uh, what I'd like to do is discuss the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, to also discuss some uh, community issues in particular uh, what's going on with the proposed baseball stadium for the city of Hartford uh, and as well uh, to talk a little bit about the upcoming election and uh, your role in that upcoming election. Uh, before we go any further, what I'd like to do is to thank uh, those of you who participated in the election uh, that took place on August 12th. There were a couple of Democratic primaries and as you know voting is an extremely important uh, privilege to exercise. Uh, those of you who did, uh, you're to be commended and uh, keep up the work, the good work uh, going forward. I want to extend a particular expression of gratitude to those who supported me uh, in this August 12th primary. Uh, obviously, I'm very inspired and uplifted uh, by that support and looking forward to continuing um, good things in the state Senate going forward. That having been said, let's get to some of the issues. And what I wanted to uh, begin today's discussion with is just a recognition of the celebration of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And uh, when you consider what was taking place back in the 1950s and 60s uh, in this country, one of the general views that I hold is that uh, the South was actually advantaged economically. I don't think there's anything good that can be said about discrimination and inequality of opportunity and denial of opportunity. Uh, but if you look at it, if you're looking for a silver lining in a cloud, uh, what, what was taking place in the South? Uh, what was taking place was that the degree of prejudice and discrimination and ignorance uh, was so uh, pervasive that uh, white folks didn't want to take green money from black folks. And what that led to was that uh, black folks were required almost uh, in order to establish institutions for themselves uh, to conduct commerce. And so you had uh, black banks in the South, you had black supermarkets, you had uh, black insurance companies, black uh, morticians, black professionals like doctors and lawyers. And I think that was an extreme advantage uh, for the economy of many black communities in the South. Uh, but what, was, what else was taking place? Uh, there was a lot of activity in terms of uh, the emerging protest movements. Uh, in 1955, you'll recall, um, there was a Montgomery bus boycott. And from that movement in Montgomery emerged uh, one of the civil rights icons, that was Rosa Parks. And she was at the center of the Montgomery bus boycott. You'll remember the story. Uh, she refused to give up her seat uh, to, uh, on a bus to a white passenger. Uh, and all heck broke loose as a result of that. She ended up being arrested, ended up being uh, the face of the civil rights movement 
uh, at that particular time. That was 1955. Uh, what else was happening? Uh, in North Carolina, uh, part of the history of North Carolina A&T uh, University uh, was the uh, four or so students that participated in the lunch counter sit-in uh, at the uh, local department store. Uh, actually, I have the names of, of those students. Um, and we should remember Ezel Blair, David Richmond, Franklin McCain, and Joseph McNeil. Uh, all four were students at North Carolina A&T University. And in 1960, uh, they were protesting uh, the segregated lunch counter at F.W. Woolworth Department Store uh, in North Carolina. Um, and then there was what was generally called the Birmingham Campaign, which was a uh, protest against uh, discrimination and uh, denial of opportunity uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. And I remember this. Uh, campaign, uh, which was occurring in 1963. Uh, one of the reasons I remember it so well is because at the time I was visiting uh, my godmother and godfather, uh, both whom uh, resided in New York City, Jamaica, Queens, New York, and we were watching television and we saw images of black people being attacked by uh, German Shepherd police dogs uh, black people being subjected to uh, water from water hoses and um, all of these images were, were extremely horrific. We were introduced to a character by the name of Bull Connor uh, who was the sheriff of Birmingham and uh, he didn't mind apparently being as ruthless as possible uh, especially in his treatment of uh, black folks. Um, and it was those images, I think, that um, contributed significantly to uh, the attitude that, uh, you know, the country had gone too far and something had to be done legislatively. And there was a lot of criticism about um, the, the bill that uh, embodied the the provisions of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Many of the opponents of the bill said to Dr. King, uh, who obviously was the leader of the movement, uh, that no laws can change the hearts of men. And uh, Dr. King, in response, agreed with that, but he said what laws can do is restrain the heartless. Uh, and there were many people that came together uh, including uh, uh, the initiation of President John F. Kennedy. Um, but Kennedy, as you recall, was assassinated in 1963, and President Lyndon Johnson uh, took over uh, the presidency and uh, through his efforts, and I think he deserves a lot of, for, uh, a lot of credit for marshalling the votes and applying the political pressure in order to win the uh, passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And please recall that that act uh, sought to address uh, public accommodations and uh, equality of opportunity. Uh, public accommodations meaning uh, obviously being able to eat in restaurants, stay at hotels, um, um, go to amusement parks, use whatever water cooler uh, was available um, uh, without being subjected to discrimination and denial of access uh, to those kinds of accommodations. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 also addressed uh, employment opportunities and it established the Equal Employment uh, Commission, Equal Employment Opportunities Commission um, and it also addressed voting rights. Uh, and I think uh, the bill uh, was comprehensive in nature, uh, was not the total package, but it was uh, a very significant first step toward um, uh, 
uh, equality of opportunity uh, in the United States. It was followed, uh, as you recall, in the succeeding year by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I think the significance of, of all of those pieces of legislation uh, and the significance of what was occurring during that period of time, that kind of climate, that kind of environment, is that obviously when we look back on it today, we've come a very long way in terms of uh, race relations and uh, equality of opportunity. The significance to me is that the fight is not over. And although um, people are not being subjected today to blatant and obvious discrimination, people are not dying at the end of a rope as a result of being lynched, uh, we look at some of the things that are happening today. Uh, too many black men are being shot and oftentimes being shot by people who are wearing blue uniforms and wearing badges. Uh, that obviously has to be addressed. And so uh, we cannot rest on um, what those who have come before us have accomplished with respect to legislation like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, we've got some obligation and responsibility to work uh, for the remainder uh, of our time here on this earth uh, to take the fight and the struggle uh, to the next level and to make sure that atrocities like uh, police brutality and uh, the murder of black men at, at the hands of uh, white individuals uh, is put finally uh, to an end. And so uh, as your state senator and as a, a public figure and elected official, uh, that would be my appeal uh, to all of you who are watching this program. Uh, not to be complacent, not to rest on uh, what our forefathers have accomplished, but uh, to finish this struggle and uh, to make equality of opportunity and justice for all, uh, social and economic justice for all, a true reality uh, right here in the state of Connecticut and in the United States of America. And with that, um, I think we're coming up on a break, uh, which we'll do. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk about some more local issues uh, as well as issues of interest and concern to the community. Hello and welcome back to Senate Reports. This is State Senator Eric Coleman and um, I'm so pleased that you're uh, viewing this program. What's going on in Hartford? Um, well, I think the predominant issue happens to be uh, the proposal to have a baseball stadium in downtown Hartford. And uh, to say that this proposal has been controversial uh, is probably an understatement. There's been a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, concern as uh, 
as well as uh, apparently some emerging support uh, for the proposal. Um, but let's take a look at, um, and let me uh, voice at least some of my concerns about the proposal. The initial proposal, uh, I think, was just a bad, a bad proposal. And you'll recall that that called for uh, bonding uh, $60 million in order to uh, finance uh, merely a baseball stadium. And uh, I think all of this uh, proposal uh, came about as a result of secret meetings between the mayor and the Rock Cats baseball stadium, which is currently um, uh, located in the city of New Britain and uh, playing their games in the city of New Britain. Uh, New Britain residents are, I think it's fair to say, a little miffed about uh, what they call Hartford's poaching of their baseball team and luring them into the city of Hartford. Uh, my concern uh, is that, but I think even more importantly, uh, what it's going to cost the taxpayers of the city of Hartford uh, in order to construct a baseball stadium um, in the city of Hartford, the downtown north section of the city of Hartford. And as I said, I, I think the current proposal um, is better than what was initially proposed uh, back in June of this year. Um, but I still have some of the same concerns. Uh, one of the major concerns that was addressed to the initial proposal was the lack of private investment uh, in that proposal and the real likelihood that the cost of that stadium would fall on the backs of uh, the already overburdened taxpayers of the city of Hartford. Uh, in response to some of the uh, protests and uh, uh, outrage that was expressed by some of the residents of Hartford regarding that initial proposal. Uh, the mayor and the city council went to work and made some revisions uh, to the proposal. And uh, primarily in response to uh, uh, a lot of people's uh, sentiments that a baseball stadium alone would not serve as the catalyst that uh, uh, some city officials were hoping uh, would be the case. Uh, there were other components that were added, uh, like uh, retail and housing units. Um, and so now the price tag has ballooned to $350 million. Uh, much of that, the city believes at least, uh, much of that can be um, paid for by what is essentially tax increment financing. And so that the combination of the lease payments that the city would um, receive, um, the property tax payments, and the uh, indirect jobs that would be created, as well as the indirect revenues from taxes that would be created, would be sufficient to um, pay back the investors and uh, to uh, relieve the taxpayers of the city of Hartford of any, signif any significant increase in their property tax bills. Uh, all of that is so speculative. Uh, there are so many things, I suppose, that we can agree on. Um, I think the opponents of the stadium as well as the proponents of the stadium uh, agree that some development in the city of Hartford uh, needs to take place. And there needs to be a development that would be a catalyst uh, in the city of Hartford um, that would basically uh, attract folks uh, that maybe don't even reside in Hartford, but attract them to Hartford, um, at which time they would spend dollars on restaurants, uh, in retail establishments, uh, in other uh, manners, uh, all to the benefit of 
the coffers of the city of Hartford and the residents of the city of Hartford. Uh, that is, uh, to me, so speculative. The other thing that we agree on, both opponents and proponents of this particular development, is that um, it is a leap of faith. Uh, I was uh, somewhat surprised, but I guess uh, encouraged that the proponents of the proposal uh, would describe it as a leap of faith, and it is. Uh, but my feeling is that if we're going to make a leap of faith, uh, why not make that leap of faith on something uh, that directly benefits the neighborhoods of Hartford? One of the criticisms that I have, uh, not only with the city of Hartford, but with the state of Connecticut and its approach to economic development is that uh, too often our economic development initiatives rely upon uh, attracting people from outside of Hartford to come to Hartford and spend money. Uh, and it ignores the fact that we have a population uh, right here in Hartford, um, many of whom are not taxpayers because they're not working, they don't have uh, an income, um, they don't own property that would require them to pay property taxes. And I think a better approach to economic development would be to make um, this population of folks uh, taxpayers, do what we need to do in order to uh, make them job ready, uh, create jobs for them to fill, uh, and that obviously would not be the, the high-tech, um, uh, bioscience kinds of uh, advanced jobs uh, that the state of Connecticut is currently engaged in with uh, the Jackson Labs Initiative or the United Technologies Initiative. Uh, but uh, construction jobs are fine uh, as long as there is some avenue for residents uh, of the city of Hartford uh, to move in positions uh, so that they can work uh, on those construction projects. Um, obviously the, the primary goal would be long-lasting and permanent year-round jobs. Um, and until we can attract manufacturing companies back to the city of Hartford, um, that may not happen anytime soon. But let's just consider if we uh, focused on the neighborhoods uh, and an infrastructure program uh, pertaining to the neighborhoods, uh, that would certainly bring about a number of construction job opportunities and hopefully uh, those opportunities can be filled by residents in the neighborhood. If we continue a uh, focus on uh, growing small businesses in our neighborhoods. Uh, when we're talking about $350 million uh, being allocated to uh, the downtown north uh, proposed development, if you took even a portion of that $350 million and let's say um, allocated that money to just completely make over Albany Avenue, the commercial strip of Albany Avenue, or the commercial strip of Blue Hills Avenue, Barber Street for that matter, North Main Street for that matter. If that money were invested in that manner, um, I think the city of Hartford and um, obviously the residents of the neighborhood would be much better benefited uh, than would be the case uh, if the um, proposed development for downtown North uh, were pursued. Or another alternative, uh, if you're uh, hell-bent as the city officials uh, seem to be on uh, bringing this baseball stadium uh, proposal to fruition, um, consider the alternative. If the objective is to attract people to uh, that section of town uh, and hopefully uh, encourage them to spend uh, 
whatever dollars uh, would be beneficial uh, to the city. Uh, instead of spending $350 million on a baseball stadium, why not spend uh, a couple of million dollars and make that uh, area into an outdoor amphitheater with the idea in mind of hosting things like uh, jazz festivals, festivals and other outdoor exhibits uh, that would be attractive uh, to people uh, similar to the way the, the concerts in Bushnell Park may be attractive to many people, not only Hartford residents, but people who live outside of Hartford. But do it on an even more grander scale, not to compete with um, whatever types of concerts are taking place with uh, the Xfinity Center or Comcast Center in the Meadows or uh, the activities in Bushnell Park, uh, but to develop something like the Jackie Robinson uh, Foundation Jazz Festival or the Newport Jazz Festival, Montreal Jazz Festival, uh, those kind of things, um, as well as uh, different kinds of exhibits that may occur um, that may be of interest to uh, various trade organizations and associations um, that would uh, sort of be amenable to an outdoor uh, venue. Uh, so if you follow and pursue that alternative, maybe you attract uh, audiences uh, from outside of Hartford to come into Hartford for um, perhaps an extended period of time, three, four days, maybe a week. Um, and while here, uh, to utilize our hotels, to utilize our retail establishments, to obviously eat in restaurants, uh, and bring some vibrancy uh, to the city. Uh, the beauty of that alternative is you don't spend multi-millions of dollars on something that might eventually wind up in the very near future, as a matter of fact, as some sort of white elephant. Um, obviously, the city and the state have pursued other grand scale kinds of operations for the purpose of economic development. Um, Adrian's Landing obviously comes to mind. Uh, and hopefully that will um, um, that will get off the mark um, at some point in time because it was uh, I think a seven hundred and seventy million dollar investment and I don't think uh, I'm speaking out of school when I say the return on that investment is nowhere near what the expectation has been. The same with the Connecticut Science Museum. Um, not only did that cost what it cost initially, but uh, the state only recently, within the last year, uh, was required to bail that operation out and contribute more millions of dollars in order to just keep that thing going. Uh, when the convention center was being considered, uh, there were consultants' reports that said that the convention center, uh, in competition with uh, the Mohegan Sun and the Foxwood uh, convention uh, activities and events uh, would be, end up being a white elephant uh, in Hartford uh, and that it should not be built. Um, uh, Governor Rowland and his administration chose to ignore um, those projections by consultants and proceeded with the convention center as a part of uh, the whole Adrian's Landing development. Uh, and additionally, um, consider the Excel Center and the various remakes and um, renovations that were required uh, in order to keep uh, that facility up to date. So uh, there's a lot to think of about in terms of development for the city of Hartford, um, whether or not the baseball stadium um, is a good deal uh, long term. Uh, I have my doubts, others have their doubts. Uh, I'd be happy and others would be happy if the city would consider uh, alternative proposals and actually 
uh, give a great deal more thought to what can be done to benefit the neighborhoods uh, directly. Uh, but these and other issues, uh, I guess we'll have to reserve because we've run out of time for uh, a future discussion with this program. Uh, again, this is State Senator Eric Coleman. Um, I appreciate that you took the time to view uh, what it is that I've had to say today. I hope that you'll tune in in the future and keep abreast of what's happening in the second senatorial district as well as the state of Connecticut. Um, thank you for watching uh, Senate Reports.